Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this meeting of the Transportation and Parking Commission. My name is Donald Scalia. I'm the Director of Public Works and the Chair of the Commission. I'd like to welcome everyone. And um, I would also like to announce the uh, audio and video recording of this meeting. Uh, Beth, when you are ready, please call the roll. Sorry about that. For some reason, I wouldn't unmute me. Donna, are you here? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Devin is not here yet. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, Diana? Nancy? Here. Karen? Here. Jamila? Here. Carolyn? Yes, here. Adam? So we're missing Adam, Diana, and Devin at the moment. That's correct. But you've got seven people for a quorum. So. Yeah, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Beth. Okay, next up, um, I'll ask for anyone who has a public comment, folks who'd like to address the commission um, on any topic. Um, but I will uh, ask uh, for folks who are here to comment on the high school or anything that is uh, on the agenda, on our agenda this afternoon, you could please hold your comment until we get to the actual agenda items. I'm going to do a brief uh, presentation on the results of the high school traffic study. Um, but if you could hold your comments until we actually reach that agenda item, that would be very helpful to just help the meeting flow a little bit better. Um, but if you are here to speak on a topic not related to the high school, uh, we are happy to hear you now. So you're welcome to either raise your uh, uh, virtual hand um, or your actual hand and we'll try to see you so I, I, and we will recognize you. Um, I need you to limit your comments to three minutes and save your name and address for the record. Um, again, if you're here to talk about the high school, I would ask that you hold your comments uh, until we actually get to that item on the agenda. So for those folks who are here to not speak to us about the high school, um, I do see a hand raised. So we we'll recognize you, Kim, we'll unmute you in a moment. Did you call on me? Yep, go ahead, Kim. Okay, could you speak cl closer to the mic because it's very hard to hear you. Thank you. Um, I'm here for the public comment session because uh, I'm very concerned about the intersection at Hatfield Street and Cook Avenue. Um, I'd like to find out how the Transportation and Parking Commission can start to address that. I'd like to see work begun uh, for some traffic calming mechanisms, spring of 2023. A little history on that. We started talking to the city about this 30 years ago. 75 neighbors met with the city at the JFK Junior High School to talk about the dangers at this intersection and ask for help. About 10 or 15 years ago, approximately 25 people met with the city in the council chambers Again, asking for help with that intersection. We're back again. We need your help. We want to know what the process is. I did myself send in a traffic calming request letter on January 8th to city councilors, uh, DPW director, Chief Casper, um, somebody else here. Oh, Carolyn Mish. I haven't heard back from anybody yet. That was January 8th. That is my traffic calming request. Um, we'd like the city to come down and take photographs, walk that area with neighbors who have to go through there every, every day and take their life in their hands. Take some photographs and let's sit down with neighbors and figure out what are some things we can do right away. We need your help. Can't set this back anymore. We don't wanna wait for the state and the rotary or, or the stop sign at North King and Hatfield. We need action now. 
please help us out. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, could you please just state your name and city of town of residence for the record? Kimberly Lambert, can you speak closer to the mic, please, Ms. Scalia? Uh, Kimberly Lambert, Pines Edge Drive, Northampton. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other public comment from any member of the public? Uh, Michelle Bernhard, I see your hand up. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm also ringing in on the Hatfield Cook Avenue intersection. Um, I'm a teacher at Northampton High School, so I'm also very eager to hear about the traffic coming by the high school. But um, I've lived on Cook Avenue since 1998, and um, I didn't have children until 2004. And one kid is in college now, and the other's a junior at uh, the high school. And I always really would have loved to walk to Jackson Street School, but that street is like an off ramp from the highway. And we would love to see sidewalk corners on the four corners there, maybe a, a, a speed mound or bump through that intersection, um, just so that people will slow down. Um, a lot of people bike and walk up to the um, conservation area up where the Moose Lodge used to be. And um, it's just a really dangerous intersection. There are accidents there every month. Um, people have been hit and um, we would really like the city's help in making that a safer, more accessible part of our city. And I live at 164 Cook Avenue. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments, appreciate it. Next up is Deb Henson. Go ahead, Deb. Unmute. There we go. So we are not to talk about anything related to the intersection across the street from the high school at this point. We will have chance later. Is that what I understood? It, yeah, that's correct. Let's just get through the um, let's just get through the agenda. Thanks, Deb. Okay. Any other comments on things not related to the high school? Okay, seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to approval of the minutes from the previous meeting, December 20th, 2022. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? I'll make the motion. Second. Okay, by way of discussion, um, there has been a minor revision to the minutes um, by uh, Beth Caplett. Um, she has revised uh, a portion of Chief Casper's remarks that in October 2021, a directed traffic enforcement program was begun. Uh, the program uses speed and collision data to direct traffic enforcement to various problem streets across the city. Northampton High School was added to the list of streets that were targeted in 2022. That is the one revision that we have uh, two minutes. Uh, is there any discussion around that? Okay, hearing none. Beth, roll call, please. Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Devin? Diana? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Adam? Uh, that passes unanimously. Okay, thank you, Beth. Next up are reports from departments and subcommittees. Um, as far as DPW goes, I will um, I, I will make my comments on, on the high school shortly, but just uh, open it up and, and ask if anyone else uh, on the commission has any updates or comments for us. The 
Okay, seeing and hearing none. Next, uh, matters before the commission. First is an update on the traffic study at Northampton High School. Um, so the way I'd like to do this is um, I'm gonna run through some uh, history, um, sort of how we got to this place. I'm gonna talk about the results of uh, Fuss and O'Neill, who are our engineering firm, um, uh, who worked through this study for us. I'm gonna give a, a probably between uh, comments of between 10 and 15 minutes um, that just kind of give us an overview um, of, of what, what changes are actually proposed. Um, and at, then at that point, we will open it up to discussion from members of the commission um, and, and then also from members of the public. Um, but I would like to recognize Mayor Chiara who is here with us and uh, Mayor, before I get started, I didn't know if you had any uh, comments for us um, or if you want to sort of uh, kick this off. Sure, I'm glad to. Thank you, Director Lestalia. And uh, hello, everyone. It's good to be back at TPC. Um, as you just heard from Director Lestalia, we have the Fuss and O'Neill study of the intersection at the high school um, and also had an opportunity to meet with them to ask some follow up questions from the study. Since making this area safer is an absolute priority, um, we want to move forward as quickly as possible with the primary recommendation that the director will talk about. Um, uh, and the primary recommendation that will have the largest impact on safety, which is signalization at Elm and at Woodlawn. The engineering and design for signals and then installation takes quite a bit of time. I think people sometimes think that they're very easy to just hang lights, but um, it's a long process and it's also a very expensive process. So um, I've asked Director Lascalia to prepare what's needed to start this process um, as quickly as possible. So that's why we're, we're here today to talk about this. Um, there was also an order on the city council's agenda this Thursday that um, appropriates $500,000 of ARPA lost revenue funds to begin the design bidding and construction administration for this project. There will be significant additional funds that will be needed to be appropriated as the project moves forward. But um, I think that this is a good use of these lost revenue funds to get this process started. And again, we're trying to, because we know that it will take some amount of time and we really want to move forward as quickly to make this as safe as possible. Um, we, I, I wanted to appropriate some funds to make sure that we could get that process started. Director Lascalia will also go over some of the smaller recommendations that um, can be implemented more quickly um, that we, will move forward as fast as possible too, but it's really the, these two lights at these two spots are the, the main thing that um, Fuss and O'Neill believes will, will bring about the safest uh, situation there. So um, that's, I'm fully support doing this and doing this quickly. And I really thank you all so much for putting it on the agenda to talk about it. And um, I'm happy to hear your thoughts and um, I will hand it back to you, Donna. Thank you, Mayor. I, I appreciate you being here. Um, it, Beth, can you please have the record reflect that Devin Bruce has joined us? Thank you. Um, so as I said, I'm, I'm just going to um, briefly run through a little bit of history around this area and then talk about some of the recommendations um, prior to opening up this up for discussion. So if you'll just bear with me, um, that this will be about uh, 10 or 15 minutes and, and we'll try to get through it um, as, as uh, quickly as I can while sort of maintaining the uh, content and the context. Um, so it, it's important to just start with sort of timeline, recent history, how did we get here? Um, so as, as most of you probably know, a cyclist was struck and killed by the intersection of Woodlawn Avenue and Elm Street at about 4.15 p.m. on October 8, 2021. There was discussion following this crash at this commission on October 19, 2021. School staff were present to give comments um, by both me and Chief Casper. Um, sort of opened it up for, for comments from uh, residents and folks who have experience in this corridor because we wanted to hear what folks thought were um, on, on really kind of what we needed to pay attention to. Um, and again, at this commission, we, we discussed the area in November and December of 2021, as well as February of 2022. Um, after our November TPC meeting, we uh, temporarily prohibited uh, parking in the five spaces by Child Park to allow for uh, the concept of continuous bike lanes. It seemed 
um, that that was a way to sort of open up that uh, uh, crosswalk and sort of open up side li sight lines. Um, and at the December meeting, a U-turn prohibition was proposed at the intersection of North Elm and Elm Street to reduce conflicts with pedestrians, bicyclists, and other vehicles, um, which ultimately went to city council, was approved, and was signed and implemented. Um, a year ago, uh, so at the February meeting uh, last year, we announced our plan to hire a consultant to study traffic in the vicinity of the high school and to provide recommended safety improvements. So it has been nearly a full year um, since we engaged with the engineering firm of Plus and O'Neill, and now we're here to talk about what they have found. Um, in the meantime, the Northampton PTO, and, and I would just like to acknowledge um, uh, the, the efforts of the PTO and, and particularly Megan Peck, who was um, just a, a very excellent to, to work with and great lines of communication um, and talking about what we could do to make this area safer and just sort of brainstorming um, it, you know, ideas around traffic safety. Um, but they conducted a survey which received over 500 responses. There were seven multiple choice questions regarding how safe the respondents felt before the start, during and after school hours, um, there were a lot of concerns raised regarding near accidents, high speeds, chaotic and overwhelming intersections, and drivers not yielding to pedestrians. I think the takeaway was, you know, there's a lot going on here. Um, there were a lot of suggestions, with the most repeated one being an added light for people to cross. So that, was, uh, that was actually you know, a sort of signalization of, of the uh, intersection was, was kind of a, um, a, a suggestion that, that was submitted to us by a lot of folks. Um, these survey results were, were shared at this commission um, among city staff and also with the engineering firm Plus and O'Neill. Um, we've also received multiple traffic calming requests for, for streets surrounding the high school um, from folks who have been involved in a variety of, of near misses or who have witnessed uh, near misses. Um, so now a little bit about the area. The high school borders both Elm Street and North Elm Street. Um, to make this easy, I, I uh, tend to refer to the Route 9 corridor. Um, so we all know now we're talking about sort of the, the main roadway here. Um, the speed limit for Route 9 is 35 miles an hour, and that is per a speed regulation, which was implemented in 1986, and uh, additionally one that was implemented in 1977. These are approved by MacDOT, and they are regulatory and enforceable speed limits. The city does not have the ability to just change that speed limit um, without a regulatory process or with the imposition of a school zone, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later in this agenda. Um, there are marked crosswalks on the west, west and south legs of the main intersection on Route 9, and there's also a rectangular rapid flashing beacon at the southernmost crossing. Um, so we have crosswalks, we have signage, uh, we have painted bike lanes that are marked on both sides of Route 9, but there is a gap between Woodlawn Avenue and Elm Street. So that's the area where I talked about temporarily banning parking earlier. So we'll talk about the traffic safety study that was conducted by Plus and O'Neill now. So Plus and O'Neill reviewed pedestrian and bicycle safety, vehicular traffic flow, parking conditions, and traffic controls in the vicinity of the high school. The intersections analyzed included North Elm Street and Woodlawn Avenue, so Route 9 and Woodlawn Avenue, North Elm and Elm Street, so Route 9 and Elm Street, Elm Street and the Northampton High School uh, parking lot entrance, and Elm Street and Milton Street and Riverside Drive. The study evaluates alternative circulation and traffic control, as well as pedestrian and bicycle safety improvements uh, to, to improve just kind of what we what we refer to as traffic circulation. So we're not just looking at the particular part of Route 9, we're actually looking at the roadway network all around the high school because when you make changes to one thing, it can affect um, uh, circulation in other locations. Um, so first thing Bus and O'Neill did was uh, uh, collect a, a huge amount of data. They took turning movement counts, they took, uh, they took it via automatic traffic recorders um, consisting of 48-hour directional vehicle volumes, classifications, and speeds. 
Um, they also pulled the crash history between January 2017 and July of 2022. They looked at parking occupancy and just general field observations. And I will also add that um, I, uh, Chief Casper and I, um, uh, members of the PTO, Councilor Foster, um, the mayor, um, all of us have, have been present at various times to look at traffic circulation, to see, you know, pick out drop off, um, you know, what is, uh, you know, how are people walking? Where are they walking? How are they driving? So, you know, not only is it data, but it's also like, what's actually happening? Let's put eyes on this and see what's actually happening. So just a, a few kind of data points to sort of inform the conversation here. Um, speed and volume data collected April 5th, 2022. Woodlawn Avenue posted 25 miles an hour, 85th percentile speed, 34 miles an hour. Average daily traffic, over 3,600 vehicles. So North Elm Street, this is Route 9, posted 35 miles an hour, the 85th percentile speed, 38 miles an hour. Average daily traffic, 8,590 vehicles. Um, Elm Street posted 35 miles an hour, 85th percentile, 35 miles an hour, um, average daily traffic, 6,003 vehicles. Crashes, North Elm Street and Elm Street, we've had 12, North Elm Street and Woodlawn, we've had five, Elm Street, Milton Street and Riverside Drive, we've had four crashes, so that's over the past five years. Um, October 8th, 2021, as I mentioned, there was a cyclist fatality at the North Elm and Woodlawn intersections. And North Elm and Elm Street, so Route 9 and Elm Street, have had two pedestrian collisions September 2019 and January 2022, and obviously countless uh, uh, near misses um, that, that I'm sure many folks have, have witnessed. Um, parking occupancy on a typical school day. On Route 9 between Woodlawn Avenue and Elm Street, uh, on the school side, the on -street those on-street parking spaces are generally 67% occupied. In the Northampton High main parking lot, it is generally 82% occupied. Field observations. Those doing pickup and drop-offs tend to ignore the no parking signs on the park side of Elm Street and then perform a three-point turn to return to westbound Elm Street. At Elm, Milton, and Riverside, drivers tend to ignore the stop bar on Riverside Drive and stop at the crosswalk to have better sight distances. Um, this is a frequent thing that we see in intersections where the stop bars are set back too far from the intersection. Folks sort of creep uh, over the stop bar or creep across the crosswalk. That's a phenomenon that we're seeing there. Um, also some confusion on who may have the right of way at, at that intersection is a little bit tricky there. Um, so, you know, when we engaged Fuss and O'Neill, what we asked of them was to review the network, pull data, make field observations, but we also have to guide them and say, these are the things we want you to look at. So what did we tell Fuss and O'Neill to look at? We looked at actually closing off the intersection of Route 9 and Elm Street. So just close that right off. No vehicular traffic allowed not a viable option due to traffic volumes. That would put undue stress on the residential roads throughout the entire network. But we have to ask the question. And, and that's what a big part of this exercise is. And that's what a big part of the process is and why it took us 12 months to get where we are because we have to ask a lot of questions. We, we don't just make a decision. Um, next, roundabouts, an agenda item, and I'll talk, talk a little more in detail about this when we get there, um, but we looked at actually the imposition of roundabouts right in the middle of Route 9, kind of geometrically, what would this look like, what would it do to traffic flow, how would it affect it, um, not a viable option because the area is basically surrounded on both sides by protected land associated with South Park. Right? Parkland under the Massachusetts Constitution. Um, it, you know, without the ability to utilize um, or, or to really expand the footprint of, of, of Route 9, um, a, a roundabout is just geometrically impossible to fit into that space. Um, and again, you know, very high volume of, of vehicular traffic 
Um, so, you know, we'd be looking at sort of a park style, um, very large kind of superimposed uh, circular um, vehicle circulation, if you will. Um, next, we looked at converting Woodlawn Avenue into a dead end. Uh, not a viable option due to uh, a primarily impeding residential access um, and, and also negating the need for a traffic signal at the intersection of Route 9 and Woodlawn, um, which is really important to control vehicle queuing, pedestrian queuing, and, and to give kids uh, uh, kind of a safe way to get across the street. So, what are the actual recommendations of the study? There are several. Um, some of them are things that we can easily do um, and that we are looking to do uh, tonight. Um, you know, some of them are more long term, um, but all of them are important. So, um, what we've got, um, and I'm having a hard time seeing the map on my screen share, but um, so what we have done is we have, um, we're, we're showing you a map of um, the proposed improvements and they are lettered. So I start with the letter A and kind of work my way through the, the various improvements and it goes up to I think uh, the letter I. Um, so I'll just talk briefly um, about what we're doing associated with kind of each location. So the biggest recommendation to come out of this study is, is uh, A, if, if you look at the, the map on the screen, the installation of traffic signals at both study intersections along the Route 9 corridor. Um, along with that is the implementation of a pedestrian refuge island and, and just sort of um, associated kind of tightening up of the intersection. Um, this will uh, obviously substantially improve intersection operations and reduce delays. Um, signalizing these two intersections increases the safety of pedestrians crossing the road because there would be an exclusive pedestrian phase associated with these signals. Um, you know, current conditions have a lot of exposure for pedestrians. Um, we, we sort of, you know, the crossing guards do the best they possibly can, but there is a lot of asphalt, there is a lot of ground to cover, um, and, and it can be very confusing for drivers, you know, stop, start, the sun's in your eyes, there's a lot of traffic, um, it, you know, it, it, there's sort of chaotic traffic flow. So signals, there's, there's two A's, there's two letter A's on that map. So what you're looking at is a signal at both the intersection with Woodlawn and you are looking at a signal with the intersection of, of Route 9 and L. And that is kind of the biggest uh, piece of this study. It is the most costly piece of this study. And it is also the piece of this study that is going to take the longest. Um, so, so the next item on the agenda, just to give a little preview, is to ask this commission to contemplate um, the installation of traffic signals here, because that's really the first step towards taking uh, this step, um, is, is we have to have a discussion about this uh, in this commission. Um, so that's really the biggest takeaway um, from this report, and I will also add that this has a price tag of in excess of, of, of a million dollars. Um, so, you know, we are looking at major changes to uh, the roadway um, and, and sort of a, a prolonged project. So we, we want to move on this as quickly as we possibly can. Um, okay, so next, uh, B, uh, letter B, we are looking at the permanent removal of the existing five parking spaces on the east side of North Elm Street between Woodlawn Avenue and Elm Street and the implementation of a bicycle lane in its place. So, you know, the, the parking has been temporarily restricted here for a significant amount of time. I think folks are generally respectful of that. Um, but what we are looking to do is, is a permanent parking restriction here and a, uh, a restriping of the roadway in the spring to have a, a continuous bike lane, um, but with permanent signage restricting parking here. Um, so it, 
again, you know, pick up and drop off operations can, can certainly lead to a, a high volume of folks trying to cross the street and cars parked in this location are really hurting sight lines. Um, and, and they're really sort of infringing uh, on the ability of bicyclists to have continuity in this section. Um, so again, uh, as sort of a uh, preview of what's coming up on the agenda here, uh, we are going to be asking for a vote tonight for a, a, uh, this afternoon for a permanent parking restriction in this area, um, a, a positive recommendation from this commission, um, and, and then move things to council. Next, item C. We're looking to construct a bump out on the west side of North Elm Street to replace the existing 50 foot long painted bump out that already exists. Um, and it, you know, the idea behind a, sort of a physical barrier in the street versus a painted barrier in the street, um, it definitely has a traffic, a traffic calming effect. Uh, both can have a traffic calming effect, but, uh, but obviously the physical impediment is, uh, it, is, is it will really slow people down. Um, so, you know, this would be part of uh, roadway geometry changes associated with the traffic signal installation. So if we come here, come through here and put in traffic signal, uh, we would be looking at, at sort of a reconstruction of the Route 9 corridor, and this would be part of it. Mm -hmm. Item D, we'd be looking to create a pickup and drop off lane inside the high school parking lot and implement one way traffic during pickup and drop off time. So, you know, this is about sort of internal parking circulation at the high school. Um, and that is a conversation that we can have if we remove buses um, from the parking lot. And the, the bus traffic in the parking lot is, uh, is, is uh, very difficult, I think, for the folks operating the buses and, and for the folks trying to work around those. Um, so that brings me to item E, which is to reopen the section of road that passes in front of the high school and construct a one-way bus lane for student pickup and drop off. So this was um, uh, something that was in operation years ago for those folks who've been around long enough to remember it. Um, and it, you know, one of the challenges with this was bad geometry um, at Route 9 in Woodlawn. It was a very confusing intersection. Um, you know, buses have a hard time kind of making that swing, um, and, and there were a lot of vehicle-vehicle uh, uh, conflicts there. So with the imposition of the traffic signals on this corridor, the expectation would be a, a very orderly traffic flow. But item D, which is new circulation in the parking lot at the high school, really is contingent upon reopening that section of roadway in front of the high school in order to get the parking lot relieved of buses so that we can focus on car flow. Next F, create a dedicated parking lane on the north side of Woodlawn Avenue. So uh, this has um, uh, actually already sort of been accomplished through our uh, line scraping contract last year. We uh, attempted to have our contractor grind out the double yellow center line on Woodlawn Avenue and shift it so that cars parked on Woodlawn would have a, a, a little bit more space to park and then to travel in. Um, you know, because uh, geometrically we don't have perfection in our right of way, um, we don't necessarily have a wide enough space to achieve complete symmetry in what we were trying to accomplish. Um, and anytime you're trying to grind off, you know, old pavement markings, it's, it's just not uh, the, the best case scenario. Um, but this recommendation has already uh, been sort of uh, pseudo implemented, if you will. Next is G. Add a pedestrian refuge island between Riverside Drive and Milton Street. Um, and, and that uh, it, now we're sort of uh, shifting off of Route 9 to this area. Um, and, and G and H are, are sort of related because what we'd also be looking to do is realigning Riverside Drive and shifting the stop bar north. Um, because as we talked about, we, we just have a confusing intersection and folks are sort of rolling into crosswalks and, 
and you know the stop bars are, are sort of stuff is tech back a little bit too far so we'd be looking just to to sort of geometrically clean up this intersection uh and tighten it up um for folks both in cars and on foot um and then the last piece of this is item i turning milton street into a one-way between elm street and ormond drive now converting milton into a one-way southbound decreases conflict points at this sort of geometrically difficult intersection um, and it, it also allows space for a dedicated bicycle lane. Um, and we would expect that this again would improve the overall circulation of traffic in the area. So, you know, the, the total cost for everything that I have just talked about, um, it, you know, including signals and, and, and all the geometric changes. Um, we're looking at about $3 million, and that's in today's value. Um, so, it, you know, depending on how long it takes to implement, we could be looking at, at a price tag in excess of that. Um, so just a, a, a couple more words, and, and then I will stop. Um, one of the things that we try to do is move as quickly as possible. Um, but we are a municipality and we are governed by very strict procurement procedures. Um, we have uh, considerable amounts of design that we have to do on any roadway improvement project. Um, if I were to send this out to design today, I would expect it to take 12 months. So any geometric changes to a roadway um, to install a signal or realign an intersection and to examine potential utility conflicts and drainage needs and am I trying to build something on top of a water main and what do I do about that? Um, I would expect a 12 month process to sort of vet this project and generate actual construction drawings which could be used to build the, pro the project. So this is why we're having this conversation now with the hopes that we may be able to mobilize a contractor in the construction season of 2024, so not this construction season, but the next one. Um, so that is uh, the executive summary of Fussy and O'Neill's report. Um, I do have two people here representing the high school. So I would like to uh, recognize them um, and, and ask if they have any comments for us. Tammy, uh, I'm gonna unmute you and please, um, if you could just uh, tell us your position with the school for the record. Hi, um, I'm Tammy Lieber. I'm the transportation director at the schools. Um, I'm loving the plans. I'm telling you that getting the buses out of the, the parking lot is, is probably the, the best idea i don't know why they ever uh closed that that road um and i'm not sure why i, th I think it was to increase a, a park and, and something out in front of the high school but um i think opening that up and the two traffic lights will definitely help um we've implemented in the last year year and a half um we're now at three crossing guards out in front of the high school and i'd like to have four i'd like to have one down in milton but unfortunately the hiring process has been a little difficult, uh, as we all know. Um, we've, we've put three crossing guards there to keep traffic flowing as fast as possible because it is a huge street. And that way we have somebody on each side of the street. So we're only walking halfway across just to, just to keep traffic flow going. Um, it's a tricky situation. I'm, I'm loving how much they actually did around the entire school. Uh, going into the parking lot and redesigning the pickup and drop off is wonderful. It needs to be done. Um, I, I can't say too many bad things about the whole study. I think that what you're proposing um, is is just great. And I'm just uh, glad for all the work that everybody has put into it. The PTO that really did that study ahead of time that we got a lot of good feedback from. I'd like to thank you on that. Um, I'd like to get it done <laughs> as soon as we can. but. Uh, I know it's going to be something that's going to take a little while to do, but I'm very supportive of this whole thing. Tammy, thanks. I appreciate your comments. Um, I I would ask uh, Chief Casper if you wouldn't mind, would, would you just um, kind of brief us on the efforts that your department has been making in the area around the high school, just sort of in the interim while we're waiting for this, while we were waiting for this study? 
Sure. Yeah. So what we're doing now is, as we, as Beth mentioned at the beginning, with the change in the um, minutes of the last meeting, you know, we have a directed patrol program that we put in place in October of 21, and that we use our resources as wisely as we can with the limited resources that we have. So what that is is we collect data, and then we use that data where we know we have identified problems to target our enforcement efforts. So. Um, after some of the incidents that we've had in the area of the high school over the last year or so, we've added this area onto the list. So you're more likely to see marked units out there conducting traffic enforcement and watching for a variety of different violations. Some areas problems are just speeding. Um, in front of the high school, it's, it's speeding. We have concerns around the crosswalks that we're watching, um, handheld cell phones, handheld operation of electronic devices. So they're really watching for those different violations. So you are more likely to see uh, officers out in front of the high school along that stretch um, of North Elm Street. And the second thing some of you may have noticed over the last week or two weeks is we put up a temporary speed display sign to help remind drivers of how quickly they may be going and not realizing it. But where it's posted right now, if you pass the hospital on your right and you continue kind of down the hill a little toward the high school, that's where the sign is posted. Uh, as you may have also noticed, it's currently not working because it works on batteries. And unfortunately our batteries only last so long and the higher volume of a street makes the batteries die faster because there's more traffic going by. And this is obviously a very high volume street. So we will try to change those batteries out when we can and keep that sign there. Those are signs that are really proven to slow vehicles by uh, maybe um, three to four miles an hour over a one mile period when you install those. We've had good success with the permanent ones that you may have seen across the city. Um, I know when I come into work in the morning, I'm coming into South Street and that sign is there and uh, it's a very helpful tool to remind people that they're entering a new area and to, to remind them of their speed. So those are the two short term solutions that the police department is doing right now just to have some visibility there and help educate drivers about their current speed. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate it. Um, all right, now I, I'd like to just open this up to any members of the commission who have any comments um, uh, uh, about the summary um, and, and about Professor O'Neill's findings. I don't know if um, it, anyone on the commission has any comments on this. Councillor Foster, go ahead. Thanks, and, and actually first, I just wanna start by acknowledging that um, how much has been done and how much has been done kind of behind the scenes and, and how quickly um, you, Director Lascalia and, and Chief Casper and, and Mayor to have your support um, on moving forward with this. It's, it's fantastic and I'm really pleased um, to see this and to see the financial order on Thursday's agenda. So just a, a huge shout out and thank you to start. And then um, just a, a question, Director Lascalia, thank you for the really helpful overview. If you could go back, um, to the section right in front of the high school. Um, yes, that area where, where there's E, you can't see my cursor. Um, the section E with the, um, oh no, I'm sorry, C, um, on Elm Street itself. And there's the bump out um, that the proposal is to make it permanent. And it looks to me, is that a, is that a bike lane then um, between the bump out and the traffic on Elm Street? I see, it looks like a very narrow, strip yeah sorry i'm just looking at my uh it, it might be yeah. here which is easier for me to see it yes it is it is a narrow bike lane yes i guess the only question i have and and looking at it and I, I just you know you know far more about this but i'm wondering if it's possible to protect that bike lane um but actually I'm talking myself out of it as I'm seeing the bike lane come through the intersection. And I, I know that's challenging in other sections of town where like the lane's protected and then it's not and it's moving around. So is that why to continue it straight through that intersection? It, yeah, and, and I think that what, one of the things, you know, when we put this out for design, so, so when we engage a firm to actually design this, I mean, this is a conceptual plan. So when we engage a firm, to actually design this, you know, give us a plan that we're going to hand to a contractor. Those details can sort of be worked out and, and maybe the lane could be expanded or trunk or protected, you know, depending on a variety of factors. Um, this is very conceptual level at this point. Um, so, so certainly like a, not for construction, but uh, certainly something we can pay attention to. Okay, great. Thank you. Caroline, go ahead. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll first by um, start by saying I think the other piece of the recommendation, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, Donna, is that that um, they're recommending no parking there at all. So that line of curbing conceptually should be continued all the way through to the edge so that there wouldn't be a conflict with cars trying to pull in and park there. Um, isn't that correct, um, Donna? And I think I think they just didn't have the drawing right. Um, it, yeah, I think there's some conversation about you know, in the area that says C on the plan, you know, are, are we actually looking to allow cars to park here, um, you know, as they are now? Because I believe that the high school sort of uses these spots um, for particular um, occurrences when, when maybe there's accessibility challenges, um, they can't be accommodated in their parking lot. Um, so I, I think that that's sort of a design conversation about, you know, will there be parking on the side of the street or are we going to completely remove it? Um, so the other comment I just wanted to um, raise was I think um, uh, Tammy had asked about why the lane the through traffic had been eliminated in the first place in front of the high school and you had mentioned Donna that it was a safety serious safety concern and to just clarify that opening this lane is really just for buses only. So the recommendation is in order to keep it safe that other cars shouldn't be allowed to come in there either during school hours or off school hours so that it doesn't become a, a pass through and as dangerous as it was originally when it was taken away as a cut through um, from Elm Street to eastbound Elm into downtown. So um, that's sort of part of the whole package, um, I think is just to clarify. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Carolyn. That there would absolutely be a restriction on on uh, passenger vehicles through that area. This is this is about buses, and it's about improving circulation in the area by giving the buses a dedicated place to be. And we would not want to mix the cars and the buses because um, that's sort of the phenomenon we already have going on. So thank you for that. Diane, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to say that I am just really blown away by the plans. And, you know, when this came up before the commission, I had no idea how anyone was ever going to solve this problem because there was so much that was wrong with, you know, Route 9 with the other intersection. And I think it's really great that we're also considering inside of the parking lot as well. I think, you know, people... I don't know how, how much people without high schoolers realize how much of the problem starts inside the parking lot and kind of extends to the surrounding streets. Um, I've been hit by a bus in that parking lot. So, you know, and I'm sure everybody here has their own stories about it, but I just really wanted to thank everybody who was involved in putting the survey together and, and proposing solutions. I'm sure it wasn't an easy job and I'm just really impressed by and excited about all of the proposal. Great. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Any other members of the commission have any comments? Okay, so um, at this point, I, I do note that we have um, several counselors with us. Um, so I, I do wanna recognize them as the Councilor Jerry, Councilor Nash, Councilor Minori. Um, and I just want to recognize that you're here and, and thank you for coming. Um, and, and if you have comments for us, um, please raise your hand and, and um, I'm happy to hear you. Um, so at this point, um, what I will ask is for members of the public who, who wish to you know, have a question or a comment on this, we're happy to hear you. Um, I, I do need to ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. Um, name and address for the record, please, um, as we do have uh, a, a little bit of an agenda to get through after this, but I uh, would like to hear what folks have to say on this. So first up, James Lowenthal.
Dan, you should be unmuted. I am, yes, now, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is James Lowenthal. I live, <clears throat> excuse me, at 181 Crescent Street. Um, I'm on the Bicycle and Pedestrian uh, Subcommittee, but I'm speaking as a, as a citizen tonight. Uh, I'm a former member of the Transportation and Parking Commission. Um, my daughter went to NHS, graduated a year ago. Um, I uh, live just a couple of blocks from uh, the high school, so I'm, I'm there all the time, very familiar with it. Um, I appreciate very much all the uh, time and attention and, and effort and uh, concern on everybody's part here uh, and uh, the detail and considering the options here. Um, my concern is uh, that um, it's related to the city's policy uh, that uh, for the last uh, 10 plus years has been whenever possible to avoid signalized intersections in favor of roundabouts because roundabouts are much safer. Okay, so we can't do a roundabout here because there's not room, but we still have the problem that signalized intersections are inherently not necessarily the safest because uh, when the light is green, they encourage cars to zoom through. Uh, if the light's yellow, cars go even faster especially when we have these wide lanes what i see in the in the plans here is 12 foot wide lanes i'm just i just get the feeling that this is going to be great for moving cars through pretty fast and i think we're just going to see continuing crashes at this intersection as we do at practically every other signalized intersection it's not it seems to me enough traffic calming and i i would invite you all all of us to think about what happened on route 9 about 10 years ago, uh, Elm Street, outside of Smith College, uh, following the, the tragic death of a Smith student in 99, uh, there was a series of traffic calming redesigns, and we finally have the, the system we have today, which does not have a signal, for example, at the main entrance to Smith College at College Lane, but instead has a raised textured crosswalk with, um, with granite uh, uh, crossings, and it's very, very clear, and also uh, uh, bike lanes and bump outs that narrow the lanes significantly. We used to have double jeopardy where there would be two cars going one direction, one car would stop for a pedestrian, the other car wouldn't see the pedestrian, would, would try to pass really uh, endangering pedestrians on a regular basis. It's completely changed now uh, because of the traffic calming that's gone in there without a signal, uh, but just by narrowing and, um, and raising the, uh, and texturing the crosswalk. Instead now, Cars stop, uh, you know, at, at a drop at the drop of a hat. When I come out of College Lane on my bike, I, I don't even have the right of way. Cars have the right of way, and they stop for me. The culture has changed there, and I just want to encourage us to to make sure that that's not the treatment that we want to do here as well. And if the engineers have studied that, um, I would love to see what their reasons are for rejecting that model in favor of of signals. Thank you very much. Thanks for your comments, Jim. Next is John Engel. We good now with audio? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. great, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to share some thoughts and thanks for all the work that has gone in. The nine points of recommendation shows significant uh, progress. I am at 21 Sumner Avenue in Florence. I have a daughter at the high school who routinely bikes and walks through the intersections in front of the school and an eighth grader who will be there next year. I was also a first responder for the accident in November when the boy was struck at the crosswalk on the westerly side in front of the building. So I have quite an invested interest in the outcome here. If it's at all possible, I would like to briefly uh, have access to screen share to so show some photos of the crosswalks in front of the school while taken in the evening, just in case the commission has not seen what those crosswalks look like under the night hours. Is that possible? It, yeah, John, I think what I would ask you to do um, just in the interest of time, because we do have a full agenda, is if you would not mind emailing us um those pictures and i will be certain that they are distributed to the commission um but i i can't give the outside uh uh non-commission person screen share in a meeting with this yeah person. happy to do that suffice it to say that the intersection closest to woodlawn the crosswalk rather closest to woodlawn avenue is well illuminated with a light over each side of the street near the crosswalk the inners, the crosswalk on the westerly side of the building has a light on the child park side and no light on the Northampton High School side, which is in fact where the boy was struck in November. And the pictures will demonstrate in fact that 
when you look at the four points of intersection coming across from either side at those two crosswalks, it's, it's quite a uh, problem to be remedied. It's, it, I think, fits in with the bump out strategy that was modeled on the map, so long as illumination is included with that. So I just wanted to, to bring voice to that. I will send the pictures along. Yeah, thank you, John. I appreciate it. And, and just to add, uh, lighting is something that we did discuss um, with our consultant. So we are aware that, that there are um, potentially some dark spots in that corridor. So I, I appreciate you, um, you bringing it up. So thank you. You're welcome. Next is Angie Gregory. Thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Angie Gregory. Um, I live at 595 Haydenville Road in Leeds. Um, and I, I echo all that's been said already um, and understand the uh, immense amount of work that goes into things like this. And to give a little bit of uh, context to other people in this meeting, um, similar to uh, James Lowenthal, I, I hang out on the Bike and Ped Commission. Um, I don't, I'm not necessarily an official member, but um, I was, a, a recent graduate of Smith College as an Ada Comstock scholar. And um, I took a um, broad scale design class where I decided to focus my work on some of the needs that were coming out of the Transportation and Parking Commission um, related to traffic calming. And so um, gratefully, the, the city now has a traffic calming manual, which I worked with um, uh, Donna on and in terms of the language. And I understand that there's uh, like a multi-step process to this. Um, any kind of uh, street altercations are going to take lots of time. And as we've seen many, many months just for the planning, let alone the implementation. So um, one thing that came through doing the traffic calming manual was that there are little things that we can do, um, you know, before some of these larger things can happen. Um, putting that aside, I'm, I'm thinking as also a parent of a high schooler. So I had a daughter who went through all four years already and graduated, and I have a son who's a freshman now. Um, and both of them took the bus. We lived farther than a mile from the school, so that was available to us. And I would encourage for any other, um, you know, high school family um, or representatives of the high school who are on this, on this meeting or this call to consider really encouraging the use of the bus because I know that they're underutilized and that can be a short-term solution that reduces the amount of congestion and the amount of conflict um, and also the amount of traffic, which I believe also creates pent up, um, you know, drivers who want to speed through because they've been delayed. Um, you know, if we're utilizing the resources and not only would taking the bus mitigate on climate because you have a lot less personal vehicles dropping off one child, um, you're reducing the congestion. So I just would encourage that as a um, immediate short-term solution that people can, um, you know, keep people can access who have students in the school. Um, and I don't know if uh, Tammy Lieber has any kind of input on how people can join into the bus mid-year or um, what if she could speak to um, how, how underutilized the, the buses actually are. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Okay, next is Elizabeth Horn. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Liz Horn. I live at 12 Barrett Place in Northampton. Um, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate all the work that has gone into this really critical issue. It makes me really um, heartened as a parent and community member. So thank you to all involved and a special thank out to Megan Pack, a parent and community member um, who really got that parent um, survey going last year that um, was so helpful. But anyway, thanks to the DPW and the study and everyone involved. Um, I am the president of the PTO at the high school and this is an issue that we talk about a lot. And I just wanted to throw out there if there's anything the PTO can do to garner support and to, um, as this process moves forward, and I understand it's gonna be a lot of time and a lot of money. So anything that the PTO can do to help um, get parent support for these initiatives, we'd be very happy to do. 
Thanks so much for your comments. Thanks. I appreciate it. Next is Sue Sullivan. Hi, everyone. I want to um, go the thanks for the study. I'm very much in agreement with it. And I wanted to say also that um, in the meantime, we need to do something about the lighting that the previous parent mentioned. It's extremely dark, uh, especially coming from the chiropractors to the high school. And I've crossed that many times for nighttime high school meetings because I teach at the high school and almost been hit several times and had to run to the island in the middle. Um, so if there's anything temporary that the city can do for lighting, even if it's just like throwing something up there, I think it would be much appreciated and definitely has um, a lot to do with continuing safety until this project can be finalized. And then one last note I wanna make is that the walkway that is in the former Child's Park property from uh, Elm Street going to the high school is really uneven and needs to be totally dug up and repaved. It's not accessible at all for anybody who's disabled. It's very, very bad shape. And then uh, the last thing I would say is that we would definitely need a crossing guard once the uh, bus street lane starts to um, form. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sue. Next is Rebecca. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Rebecca Leopold, I live at 460 Elm Street. So I'm the house just to the left of uh, everything you're looking at on the map. Um, to, I don't know my East and West, I'm a history teacher, but to the left of, of um, Riverside. Um, so I, I thank you very much for all the work. Um, since I live it daily uh, going through this whole area, um, it's, I'm glad to see particularly those changes at Milton and Riverside. It's really hard to make a turn there with those two streets coming in. Um, and there's no way that you can see without coming all the way to the edge. And part of that, I, I didn't get through all the traffic report that Alex sent today, but I was surprised at the speed reported because in fact, one of the things that would also help with the Milton and Riverside area and students you know, and going and walking and driving to and through, go by my house every day, people come flying down that hill. And I'm shocked to hear an average of 38 miles an hour. Um, I don't, you know, I, I can't, I can't, I, I'm not an engineer. So I, I, it's not that I can challenge what they found out, but I am see on a daily basis, most cars flying through there at least, at least at 50, 60 miles an hour. It's hard to get out of my driveway when school hours are on um, and other times when there's a lot of, of traffic. So I'm in terms of calming measures, I would think that another thing would help just like, I mean, rather than wait till someone gets hit like farther down Elm Street and they put the speed bumps in, putting some speed bumps in closer to the high school might help slow down the, the traffic there. And um, I guess long way off when this is finally implemented, that the, you know, hopefully these changes will mean people aren't blocking the road going from Elm Street up towards North Elm Street, but certainly the signs that were put up didn't stop the cars from parking there and stopping there. So, you know, I don't know if that's a, if that's something that the city takes care of or, or, or the high school needs to take care of, but the, after a short while, the parents ignored all those signs and then that crowds everything up. And then my last, I guess, question or comment is I was glad to hear um, because I saw it in the report that you're not recommending stopping the left turn onto North Elm Street and you're not recommending uh, one way at Lewood Lawn. At least that's what I'm hearing because that would it make already difficult movement for, for folks who live in the area. Um, you know, it's not really crowded except when the school's going in and out for the most part for those turns. So. I'm I'm hoping that that's correct, that those things are off the table, even though the engineers uh, suggested them, um, since I didn't hear you talk about it. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Next is Megan. Hello, I'm Megan Peck. I'm not sure why my camera is uh, not working. Um, so I'm former PTO vice president and uh, parent of a recent high school graduate. Um, thank you so much for devoting this meeting to traffic study. It's really exciting to hear about all the plans. It was a great experience working with Director Lascalia and the TPC members last year. 
to convey the community's concerns and to bring about the temporary parking ban on Elm and the eliminating the U-turn. I'm really grateful that Liz Horn, president of the PTO and new principal Worley are here to continue that partnership with you. Um, Liz, uh, George, Kohout and I are also part of a group of teachers, students, um, municipal board chairs that have been meeting since last fall to talk about how to initiate uh, pedestrian cyclist safety education in the school district, which is just as important as any physical interventions. And we look forward to um, advocating for the city's efforts to design and implement the recommended changes around the high school. Um, again, many, many thanks to Director Lascalia, the TPC, and our mayor for making this issue a priority for the city and for all your tireless work behind the scenes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. Next up, David Murphy. Hey there, good evening. Hey, uh, one thing, um, uh, by the way, David Murphy, I've lived at 70, 76, and 78 North Elm, one of them since 1970. So that's like 53 years right here watching this unfold. Um, was the start time ever studied? Because having been here when school started earlier, the, the problems really got bad once school start time got moved up to match morning drive time. Um, I saw the traffic studies, but did they ever examine you know, if this thing shifted back to earlier school start, would that alleviate some of the problem and get us out of the nine o'clock drive? I'm glad to see you're opening up the street in front of the high school. You have to ask Mary Ford why she had Brett bury that in the day, but that was not very enlightened. But I actually can send you a great video I shot in 1972 at the high school of the buses actually using uh, that street. I'm glad it's still under there. Uh, Woodlawn Avenue, it sounded like one way on Woodlawn was still was still an issue. Thanks for explaining why the yellow line goes all over the place now. Um, but it would be great for this parking if you actually marked it for spaces. Uh, I know on North Elm Street, our driveways get encroached on as people try to walk as little as possible to get to the high school. So both on Woodlawn and around the high school, you do want people to park. If you could mark those parking spaces, uh, that would be really good so they don't encroach on driveways as, as it gets tighter. Um, and again, Hope Woodlawn is, if you're making Woodlawn one way, uh, uh, Councillor Foster will be back to you about traffic coming on Massasoit and Franklin, because those people are just going to go down another block and come over that way if they can't come over this way on Woodlawn. Um, and, and I'm glad the legislature lets you put a, a school zone out there now. Uh, you can drop it down to 25, but Woodlawn's been 25 for some period of time, and people are going at least 10 miles an hour faster on Woodlawn. So to, to make that actually work would take some enforcement um, to make those school zone lower speeds actually, actually really happen. Um, uh, could you scroll back over to the plan where the intersection of North Elm and uh, North Elm and Elm is? Because I agree that crosswalk, several people have said it's dark. It's, it's very, very dark there. Um, the bike lane marked B, is that gonna go all the way or just up to those crosswalks? Um, it, it already extends. Um, it, it already extends beyond those crosswalks. Um, so what we'd be looking to do is just have continuity. Um, the final design of that um, whole corridor would answer that question better yeah. than it right now. Yeah, because I know up where I'm at 78, where I'm, down, I'm looking out the window and I don't see it out there now. It's on the other side, but I don't see it out there. And if cars cars have been parking up there past that intersection with North Elm and they if it's there they're parking in the middle of it I do agree with the thought of taking out the parking in area C all the way down you know because cars pulling out into traffic is some of where this problem comes from so that would be great if you could you could make that bump out go all the way down to near Woodlawn and get rid of that parking there because uh, because that does create congestion there and also the U-turns that People drop their kids off and bang you turn go the other way. Um, enforcement on that would be really, really good. Um, let's see what else I've, I've got for you here is spikes and signals. Um, I'm assuming with the signals that left turn as somebody spoke earlier, the left turn from Elm to North Elm is probably okay if there's a signal there. Without the signal that gets really, really backed up. Um, and as I said, the school zones are good. Um, 
mark spaces we talked about that um yeah i guess that's yeah, they, I was going to say thank you. Thank you for your comments. I just, I, I got to keep this moving. I, I, that's that's probably my three minutes, yeah. That's, that's your three minutes. I, I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. So, so long. Much. Thank you. Next up is Ben. Hi, uh, thanks for uh, giving me opportunity. Um, I'm not sure if I'm being audible or not but um no, we can hear you go ahead okay great um so yeah i i appreciate all all the work being done i kind of want to echo james lowenthal a bit um in that this is a design that really is all about moving cars as quickly as possible and could be modified to uh be focused on bicycle and pedestrian safety so some of it i think is a question of what what do we actually want and I know this is a preliminary design and schematic and that the, the details could be worked out. If I, uh, uh, so I like a lot that happened down with the circulation down in the parking area and the business of moving the buses into their own uh, drop-off zone. That is, is a great idea. Um, the bike lanes uh, are right now unprotected bike lanes um, and uh, Councillor Foster brought, brought this up as, as well. If we were to change these to protected bike lanes, what this would also do is create a curb area for a, a much uh, sharper turn, which will slow cars down to make that turn and gives you a larger protected area for it, again, for every single one of the bike intersections, because now you'd have a pedestrian and then a bike crossing. And so for exam example, on the right turn um, onto Elm Street, um, right now, you could very easily swipe a, uh, a, 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 a cyclist, basically curving nice, broad, fast curve in, into that turn. But if you had it as on the other side of a, of a bumper, of a buffer of some sort, then it forces the car to truly slow down and make a conscientious turn. Again, as James uh, suggested, signalization is fine. Um, but the crash rate at, at signalized intersections is actually higher than the crash rate at unsignalized intersections. And most of those where pedestrians are injured or, or bicycles are injured are in left turns. And so I think that I, I don't really object to the uh, signalization, but I disagree with the claim that that is going to be the key to safety. I think other things such as narrowing the lanes right now, they're marked at 12 feet. And I could see taking a foot off of that and giving that to a buffer for the bike lane, for example, um, and possibly raising the intersections so that it raises the consciousness of the drivers that there are pedestrians and that they're in a shared space. Um, and those, those changes would be both probably less expensive and faster to be implemented possibly than simple signalization. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Councilor Jarrett, welcome and go ahead. Hi everyone, Alex Jarrett, 8 High Street, Florence, uh, Councilor for Ward 5. And um, thanks, uh, thanks. so good to see these study results and the recommendations. Uh, thanks for the many good ideas raised. I would second taking a look at additional traffic calming to slow the traffic through the signalized intersections. I think that would be a key to safety. Um, with the Riverside Elm and Milton intersection, which won't be signalized, uh, is it possible, could we make that a raised intersection and physically force people to slow down uh, as they come down the hill or the, or the other way on Elm? Um, this is a difficult intersection to navigate on bicycle and we're thinking about, you know, the folks that will be coming down the hill and then turning onto Milton. Um, or to Riverside or exiting uh, at those locations. Um, and then I noticed the bike lane is uh, suggested to end on Elm Street between the high school and Riverside Drive. And I'm imagining that Elm Street may not be sufficient for bike lanes on both sides, but wonder if just having a lane going up the hill could help both visually narrow the road and, and make a safe space for climbing cyclists. So just a few impressions um, and uh, glad, pleased with um, these recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. OK, 
Okay, Sue, I see your hand up, um, I, and I do need to keep the meeting going, but uh, if you just have brief comments for us, that's fine. So uh, I'll unmute you. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, quick comment is that the uh, school committee is going to be sending out a school start survey to Northampton High School parents and community members within the next two weeks, according to Gwen Agna. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sue. Okay, George. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. George Kohout. I live over on State Street in Northampton. Um, I want to echo also a couple of comments that have been made today and, and appreciate very much the uh, efforts of the TPC to look at the situation in kind of a quick way. Um, I know it took a while for the report to come out, but it's very thorough and, and, uh, and accurate in many of their recommendations. Um, <clears throat> I do want to echo James and Ben regarding the signalization of these intersections. I think that there may be alternative ways to do this, um, such as down at Smith College and other places in our city. I'm really, un it's unfortunate that there isn't room here for a roundabout, which I think in a smaller scale would be really helpful. Um, I know Director Lascalia spoke about it earlier, but <clears throat> it seems with Child's Park and, uh, and other areas there that there could be some rerouting at least of that a roundabout by um, one of those intersections. I also want to echo Angie Gregory that um, we really need to look at alternatives to just um, creating a better space for vehicles, um, because this isn't just at the high school. Um, we have uh, these same situations across all of our schools in the city, cars coming and queuing up, parents who are unwilling to let their children walk or ride their bikes to school. So there's really kind of a, a cultural work that needs to be done for sure around um, the ability of children to get to school without um, individual cars. I, I haven't met the transportation coordinator, but I look forward to having a conversation with her because I'm very unfamiliar around the economics of uh, bus transportation. I know that's a, uh, a serious consideration for the city budget. Um, <clears throat> but if we're gonna try to meet our carbon goals for the city, this queuing of cars at our grammar schools, JFK, the high school, the private schools in town, we really have to take a serious look at that. Um, signalization also creates a, a, a queuing situation for cars and idling emissions that I would hope we could reduce um, by other means and not just adding more signals to this stretch of the road. And I realize too, this just isn't the uh, Northampton students and their parents, it's also the workers at Cooley Dick who use that road all the time, the residents nearby. Um, there's a lot of behaviors that need to be changed. I look forward to the discussion with the TPC too about limiting just the street, the uh, speed limits in our city. Um, so little by little, five years from now, 10 years from now, um, we're not driving our cars as quickly as we are now. Um, thanks, that was really quick. I appreciate everybody being here tonight and I'll go back on mute. Thank you, George. So I appreciate everybody's comments. Um, we do have uh, three agenda items to get through. Um, I, and I want to just ask if any or three additional agenda items to get through that do require action by this commission. So I'll ask if uh, to sort of close this agenda item out, I will just ask if there's any other members of the commission who have any uh, further comments on this before we move on to the rest of the agenda. And I don't see any, so we will uh, close out this. And hey, Director, can I just make one comment? This is Jamie. Yes, yeah, sorry, Jamie, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly understand the process here, but I do appreciate the comments about the traffic lights. Honestly, it was the only really disappointing thing to me in the plan, um, despite my appreciation for uh, its thoroughness. Um, if there is a way to somehow evaluate whether speed tables or some 
unsignalized uh, option is available to us as this moves forward. I think that would make sense. It certainly would satisfy the overwhelming you know, messages we're hearing uh, from the community here. Your, your, your point is very well taken. I, I mean, a big part of this analysis when I talked about um, what did we ask Plus and O'Neill to do? You know, can you make Woodlawn a one-way street? Can you yeah. use off this intersection? Can you drop a roundabout into the middle of Route 9? You know, these were all sort of things that were entertained sort of in the concept phase of this. Um, you know, now that, that we have a recommendation, certainly as part of the more nuts and bolts design, we can look at a variety of ways um, that, that we can design this that could potentially satisfy uh, some uh, of the comments that we've heard here today. And that's why but we have, you know, we want to get comments. We want to hear this feedback so we can share this with our consultants. So that's in terms of process, I think that's how we move forward here. Yeah, well, that's great and encouraging. I'm glad to hear that. I have one other comment I'd like to make. There was at one time uh, someone came before the commission and said that the handicapped spots that are currently in the circle uh, at the high school, you know, to get up to the auditorium, you know, there's stairs and all this. And the, the, this person had said that 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 was a burden to them to have to navigate all of that. And so if you're taking on the whole park area and the bus lane and all of that, I just thought it might be worth considering a handicapped spot uh, up in that area. Yep, that, thank you for that comment. And and that was actually part of our conversation when we met with Bus and O'Neill about this. That was actually part of our conversation to talk about uh, you know how we could potentially look at it, accessible spaces. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the commission have a, a comment before I, I move on in the agenda here? Okay. All right, thanks for a good discussion. Next up is discussion of and vote on signalized intersections on the Route 9 corridor by the Northampton High School in accordance the section uh, 285-51 of the Code of Ordinances, which is the complete streets policy. Um, so just a little background, section D7 of the complete streets policy states roundabouts, which are the favorite intersection treatment, except in the center of Florence and downtown, should be used instead of signals whenever possible. Roundabouts and mini roundabouts should be evaluated during the preliminary engineering analysis for all intersections being considered for significant reconstruction, realignment, signalization, and four-way stop. The Transportation and Parking Commission shall approve any decision to use a signal instead of a roundabout except in downtown and Florence Center. So this is from our complete streets policy. Um, now, I, I just want to be clear on, on sort of what we're asking here. The TPC is an advisory commission. Um, it, it is, uh, we make um, uh, positive recommendations, we can make neutral recommendations, um, we can even make a negative recommendation um, about various things related to traffic city. From a procedural standpoint, in order to move forward with the design here of, of, of or, or a redesign of this Route 9 corridor, to satisfy our internal city ordinance and our internal policy, um, we need to have a discussion about whether roundabouts are feasible in this location, or if they're not feasible, and if they're not feasible, uh, a signal in their place. So again, this is sort of a, uh, an internal policy um, a procedural uh, process that we have to go through um, in order to advance this project to the next stage. So I want to talk a little bit about why a roundabout will not work here. And, and then, and, and what I'd like to ask Maggie to do is to put up uh, a graphic that Plus and O'Neill um, uh, made for us um, so that you can actually visually see the geometric challenges that we're dealing with. So I, it, again, from a procedural standpoint, before I get, go back to the roundabouts, 
um, we need to just uh, reach a, a, a vote here to allow us to move forward with design for signals. Um, part of that design for signals can be the further exploration of other traffic calming uh, advancements. Um, but what we're looking to do today is we can't put a roundabout in, and here's why. So now to the graphic that you see on the screen in front of you, um, there's a few different things going on here. There is a parkland which is protected under the Massachusetts Constitution um, that cannot be touched except by an act of the legislature. So um, this is uh, sort of the equivalent of, um, in the words of a dear colleague of mine, pushing a very large rock up a very steep hill um, in order to get a, a, an, an act of, of the legislature to sort of remove land uh, remove protected land from parkland status. Um, what we asked Buck and O'Neill to do was impose a roundabout or two roundabouts into this corridor and geometrically see what it would look like. So for kind of context, the roundabout at the Wolf Park entrance is, is roughly 135 feet in diameter. Um, that can accommodate the volume of traffic, tractor trailer units, vehicle movements, and the amount of vehicle volume that we have on Route 9. So that's the sort of space that we would need. Now, that's just what works in that geographic location. Every geographic location is different. We could be looking at, you know, up to 150 feet that we would need, just kind of depending on the topography. So, you know, from a geometric standpoint, we do not have appropriate right of way in this corridor because there is protected property on both sides. The triangle of land um, to the left on that graphic that you're looking at and the, uh, the more familiar child park location on the right hand side are both protected land under Article 97 of the state's constitution. So, so superimposing a roundabout into that triangle of land and, and into the park land on the right it is just not possible. There is no shifting of the roadway that can happen in order to buy us the necessary space. So mathematically, geometrically, it just does not fit. And that graphic really says it all. So that's uh, sort of by, by way of explanation, um, I, you know, how we arrived at the, the signalization of this intersection because the roundabout is just not a viable alternative here. So again, with the signalization of the intersection, we may be able to achieve other traffic calming goals, um, but, but from a traffic flow standpoint, roundabouts are not possible. So what I would like to do is, uh, do I have a motion for a, a positive recommendation for the signalization of the two intersections uh, Route 9 and Elm Street and Route 9 and Woodlawn, uh, positive recommendation um, or a motion for a positive recommendation for the signalization of those two intersections in lieu of a roundabout. I move a positive recommendation for the signalization of those two intersections. Thank you. May I have a second? I'll second. Um, now I'd like to open this up to discussion uh, for, from uh, folks on the commission, if any. Carolyn, go ahead. Um, sorry, um, Councillor Foster, I don't know if you you beat me to the punch, um, but I just wanted to um, wonder if maybe the motion could be modified to suggest that if it is deemed that signalization is um, the most appropriate um, way to address these intersections that that be um, approved over a roundabout in the event that through the more detailed design something comes up where let's say a raised intersection at Woodlawn is deemed to be an appropriate approach um, in lieu of a signal. I just want to make sure 
I guess what I'm suggesting is that we're not locking ourselves in saying that it has to be a signalized intersection, but that the ultimately the design is still to be determined. Um, I, well, for the, the counselors on the commission, um, I, I, I guess, um, or for other members, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe that this is just us um, sort of approving um, that, that we would be willing to accept this. Um, but we would be willing to accept signalization, understanding that a, a roundabout is not viable. That's, that's my read on this, but it is not binding. Our, our vote does not bind us to signals instead of something else, it, 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 except for a roundabout. I, I was I would just say I, I think the motion should say exactly what you just said. <laughs> that it's not not that it's not the binding part, but that um, that roundabouts are not feasible here. So if the solution is signalization that the TPC recommends that approach or something like that, which is just a little bit of a tweak of the original motion, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so I, I guess I would ask um, the, the counselors to procedurally help me with how to uh, amend this motion to uh, Councillor Foster, go ahead. Yeah, as the motion maker, I can amend it. Mayor, did, did you want to pop in? I'm not sure if procedurally you had something you wanted to add there. Uh, no, go right ahead. Oh, I was hoping you were going to save me. Okay. Um, <laughs> I will amend my original motion uh, to move a positive recommendation for signalization at those two intersections if it is proved, if it is shown that that is the, what we, if the, my brain is melting down on Zoom right now. If that, that is shown to be the only way to improve those intersections, if a roundabout is not feasible or other traffic coming measures. Beth, I'm sorry about the minutes. <laughs> so that needs a second. I'll cautiously second, second that. <laughs> Councillor Gore, I'm I'm not sure if you were. Seconded. Oh yeah, I I seconded. Uh, okay, all right. Okay. Right. Councillor Gore, did you see that? So, Mayor, did you have a comment or? Are you... I mean, not unless people really want me to, which it sounds like you do. <laughs> I'm happy to riff for a couple of seconds. Um, I mean, the motion sound. You know, I I think. A motion saying that whatever uh, is determined to be the most appropriate um, solution at this uh, intersection. Um, yeah, I'm not doing much better. But I, I, I think I think you got there. That leaving open the door for other possibilities, but that this we uh, the real reason you know I think I think Director Scalia has expressed is that to be able to move forward and to be able to start exploring this and, and get balls rolling that we've already talked about can take a year, two years, we need to get through this phase. So to be able to, to start that process, we we need Transportation and Parking Commission to, um, to vote on this. But it doesn't mean that it locks it in for exactly the way that it was presented in the report. Right, thank you, Mayor. That's, I, I think that's the important clarification. At, at this point, we're not locked into anything, but we do need to move to onboard a designer to look at the feasibility of, of doing what's in the report. And, and there could be a variety of outcomes from that. Um, but we, what we do know is that geometrically, roundabouts won't fit. That, that's what we do know, and there, there's really nothing you can do to make them fit. Um, so now it's just a question of, okay, we, we know they're not going to fit, so how do we best move forward? Um, so, so I think that's the, the crux of this vote, and again, it's something that is required by ordinance, and, and that's 
So that's why we're having the, the conversation. Adam, go ahead. So um, basically the way that there's, there's some documentation that says that we're supposed to consider roundabouts first. Is that correct? That's correct. In the okay. Ordinance. So there's an ordinance that says we're supposed to consider roundabout first. So what we're doing here is where we know that roundabouts won't work. So we're preemptively saying that, um, that we, we can pursue signalization if that's what's deemed appropriate. That's correct. Okay. Correct. So I, yep. I, I think all we need to do is say something to the effect of that um, we empower whatever body this is to uh, pursue signalization if that is deemed most appropriate by the by the by the study or whatever. Right. So that's basically it. That if it's appropriate, then we're going to proceed with signalization. Is that instead of a roundabout? Correct. Instead of a roundabout. Correct. I don't even know if we need to say instead of a roundabout because if appropriate, we will proceed with signalization. I guess instead of a roundabout doesn't matter. But yeah, I think it's, I think, does that get to the core of it? It, it, like, it does. I mean, I mean, what the complete streets ordinance reads is it, it, you need to put in a roundabout. And if you're not going to do it, if right. you're going to put in a signal instead, it requires a vote from this body. Okay. So we empower whoever is going to make that decision to proceed with signalization um, if that is deemed most appropriate. Does that, are there any objections to that? Does that seem like a decent? Uh... Yeah, I, I believe that that would be the motion that we have on the floor right now. That, that's the amended motion from Tom. Oh, that is the amended motion. Okay. Yeah, uh, I thought we were still struggling with the wording, so my mistake. No, I, I Beth, can I put you on the spot real quickly and, and ask you if you were able to write down what the amended motion is? Yes, I was going to ask for clarification. I want somebody to tell me exactly how it's supposed to read. Okay. Um, so Karen amended the motion for a positive recommendation for signalization if it is shown that that is the most appropriate solution in order to proceed with traffic calming measures. That's a lot longer than what just what Adam just proposed. So, Adam, would you mind restating what what you just said? Um, that uh, who is the body that will be voting on this, or who is the body that will be carrying this out? Just so we recommend that um, that the city proceed with signalization um, if it's deemed most appropriate from the study or from the studies going forward. So I don't think you need the stuff about traffic coming in there, but like with, because it's with respect to this only, right? So that we proceed with signalization if that's essentially, we proceed with signalization if that's what's deemed most appropriate. That's far more succinct than what I said. So yes, the motion can, I, Beth, did you, were you able to write that piece down? Okay, so um, I have, we recommend that the city uh, proceed with signalization if it's deemed most appropriate. By, by the traffic study, right? Okay, from the studies going forward or from the traffic study? Yeah, I think that's that's plenty succinct. Diana, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I think just in looking at the language of the ordinance and kind of what the triggers are, if, you know, I'm concerned that we have to get the wording exactly right so that we don't cause any delays with with getting everything started. Um, so I think the motion should probably say to use a signal instead of a roundabout. Um, and then my concern about is deemed most appropriate. Um, is is that is is that a city decision maker or is that engineers that we hire or are we just voting to just accept their recommendation? What that is, I I think we probably need some kind of like an objective trigger in the in the wording of the motion, um, or if if it's something where we can say 
you know, if maybe the Transportation and Parking Commission approves the decision to use a signal instead of a roundabout, um, you know, if, you know, what I, I, what it sounds like we all agree on is that we know we definitely can't use a roundabout and that the question marks are whether this would be a signalized or not a signalized intersection at all, you know, the way some of the comments recommend. Is there a way that we could maybe word the motion more definitely just to say that we we do know today that whatever the answer is, it's not a roundabout. Um, so, you know, maybe we could word the motion like, you know, we approve the decision to um, refrain from using roundabouts under the plan and to uh, use signalization if, you know, if necessary based on a further vote or something like that. I'm, I'm not trying to make it more confusing. I'm, I'm just concerned about. No, I think it's a good point and we don't want to go too far afield here. I, you know, the, the way it, you are correct in that the ordinance is very clear on what it requires us to vote on. It requires us to approve any decision to use a signal instead of a roundabout. That that's that's what the ordinance is asking us to do. So if we're using a signal instead of a roundabout, um, it, you know, but now if the conversation is, well, we don't know if we want to use a signal, um, that's making this motion and this vote more complicated. We have a, a, a report which tells us we need to use a signal uh, or we need to use two signals. Carolyn, go ahead. I'm sorry I threw this um, <laughs> um, into the fire here, but um, so maybe then it just needs to be that the TPC um, votes to authorize use of a signalized intersection um, um, in lieu of a roundabout uh -huh. um, at this location, if it's, you know, and, and leave off the part about if it's deemed appropriate, because I think that's going to come out in the study. I mean, you're, you know, as we hire an engineer to do the design, you've taken in these comments. And um, so I, I think that further engineering will um, determine whether or not, and I'm sure the cities actually um, would like to um, save resources and not spend money on a signal if, if it's at all possible. So I, I'm not entirely backtracking. I'm just saying the way to, the, to maybe make the motion is that, that, that the TPC approves the use of a signalized intersection over a roundabout um, given the circumstances or something. Yeah, I, I appreciate the clarification. And I think um, we, we've sort of come back around now um, because we do have to, as Diana said, stay true to the language in the ordinance. What, what are we actually voting on? Um, it, you know, and, and in terms of roadway alterations, um, roadway alterations are, are ultimately uh, uh, delegated um, by the mayor to the director of the DPW, and that's how we do roadway construction projects. So this this vote is not uh, binding in that it does not bind us into using a signalized intersection. It just approves that we can do so instead of a, a, a roundabout. That that's what this does. The final roadway design. Uh, will be recommended by me and approved by the mayor. And that's consistent with how we do all projects throughout the city. So that's sort of the decision-making tree um, in, in how we move forward, if that's helpful for folks. So uh, given that, Donna and Carolyn, are, uh, now I have TPC votes to authorize use of a signalized intersection over a roundabout How's that sounding so far? And then what's the last part of the sentence? I don't think you need anything after that. Or just at these two intersections? At the two intersections, yeah. At the, I would say at the, at the two intersections on the Route 9 corridor in accordance with Section 285-51.
Councillor Foster, since this is your motion, does that sound acceptable to you? Indeed it does, thank you. Beth, would you be able to read that one more time for the record? Yes, um, the TPC votes to authorize use of a signalized intersection over a roundabout at the two intersections on the Route 9 corridor in accordance with, and what's the name? It's 285.51, the, the, what's the, what do yep. I call that? Accordance yep. with? Yep, section 285-51 of the Code of Ordinances. Okay, I'll do it again. Uh, TPC votes to authorize use of a signalized intersection over a roundabout at the two intersections on the Route 9 corridor in accordance with Section uh, 285-51 of the Code of Ordinances. Councillor Gore, you were the original second. Would you second that? Yeah, I'll second that. Um, I, I do note that there are uh, quite a few folks from the public still here. So while this is on the floor, I do want to ask, um, it, you know, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, uh, give folks from the public a uh, opportunity to comment as these agenda items come up. So I just want to confirm if there's anyone here from the public who'd like to speak to us about uh, this particular motion, the particular agenda item. Please feel free to raise your hand. Tammy, go ahead. I thanks. I couldn't find my raise the hand button. Um, my only comment would be is please take into consideration when we are looking at putting the signals in, even if it's a signal that's we're only using um, one time during the day, and that's when buses are trying to leave that new bus lane that we're trying to put in. Um, if not, we will be probably doing what Smith Boak has to do, and that is you're going to have a person out in the middle of the street stopping traffic to release those buses. Um, that is my only uh, major comment towards uh, please putting at least one signal in that we could use just during that time. Um, I know it's a little pricier to put that signal in, but I think it will um, help be a little more to get the traffic stopped to when the bus is released, they release all at once. Uh, when we leave a school. So it just is uh, very helpful if we have a light there or um, it, it's just is one thing that you've got to wait for a break in traffic and it may uh, just uh, held the buses up. That's my only comment. Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. Appreciate it. Any other discussion on the motion that we have on the floor? Councillor Foster, go ahead. Yeah, this is just more of a, of a bigger picture question. Um, as I know, as we get into the design phase, um, you know, there, there can be shifts. Could you just sort of briefly explain um, what that process will be before this is um, finalized? I know that that the recommendations will come to you um, or, you know, that you're authorized by the mayor to make them. But can you just sort of give a quick overview of any opportunity to share those with the public or sort of public input as the designs are um, being finalized? You know, I, I think that, the, you know, the design process will be a lengthy one. So re regardless of what is implemented here, we are looking at a minimum 12 month design process. Uh, during that time, um, I, you know, I'm in frequent communication with the mayor and that will be a conversation um, I, about sort of how we roll this out to the community as we hit certain design metrics. Of course, MassDOT has their process. You know, they do something called a 25% design hearing. Um, you know, this is a, a significant project with a very large price tag uh, associated with it. Um, and, and I think it's important to hear what members of the community have to say about it. So, um, it, you know, I, I certainly don't want to put the mayor on the spot, but I, I think that, you know, a, a sort of prolonged design process will require updates from me and or the mayor um, to both this body uh, and the PTO and the general public um, as it proceeds. We certainly don't want to make decisions in a vacuum. Mayor, I see you unmuted. Go ahead. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I was also just going to say what, you know, what I mentioned at the very start of this meeting, um, there are going to need to be further appropriations for this. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's, 
we have sort of seed money to get it started, but there we're going to have to go to council multiple times probably. And we need to figure out um, how we're going to fund the rest of it. So there will definitely be kind of opportunities in different ways to, to talk about um, what the plans are, including at council around appropriations. Thank you, Mayor. Anyone have, uh, hopefully council has got, uh, got answered your question. Um, all right, anyone have any further comments around this um, before we move to a vote? Okay, motion is on the floor. Beth, please call the roll. Donna. Yes. Jody. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Devin. Yes. Diana. Yes. Nancy. Yes. Karen. Yes. Jamila. Yes. Carolyn. Yes. Adam. Yes. That is unanimous. With 10 people, 10 members. Thanks, Beth. Okay, so two more agenda items, and I acknowledge we're running late, but both are very important, so I will try to get through these as, as quickly as I possibly can. Next is a proposed ordinance relative to parking on North Elm Street. I will uh, read the ordinance. In the year 2023, upon the recommendation of the Transportation and Parking Commission, an ordinance relative to parking on North Elm Street, an ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, be ordained by the city council of the city of Northampton and city council assembled as follows. Section one, with section 312-102 of the code of ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-102, schedule one, parking prohibited at all times. Location, North Elm Street side easterly from Woodlawn Avenue to a point 370 feet north of Woodlawn Avenue. And there is language struck underneath of that, which I will not read. Section two, that section 312-104 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-104, schedule three, limited time parking. Name, uh, and then there is a uh, 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 language that is struck there that I will not read. Um, so uh, just by way of explanation, um, in, in November of 2021, the limited time parking spaces on the Child Park side of Route 9 between Elm Street and Woodlawn Avenue were temporarily prohibited. This ordinance proposes removing the limited time parking and replacing it with a no parking zone. So this is temporarily posted right now, and this ordinance will make it permanent. So may I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? So moved. And a second. second. Thanks, Carolyn. Okay. Any uh, further? I'm sorry. Who was the second on that? I'm sorry. Was that Carolyn? Yep. Carolyn. Thank you. So, any further discussion around this, other than I will just add that, that that this was obviously one of the recommendations that we talked about contained within the study. All right, and now I'll ask um, if there's uh, anyone from the public who has a comment on this proposed parking restriction. Happy to hear your comments if there are any. Okay, seeing and hearing none, we have a motion on the floor. Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Uh, yes. Really important that she let them know that they can talk to the administration, and we will always want to resolve that. Um, Sorry, I think uh, we have a is, background uh, noise here. Uh, Health Information Privacy Act. So we don't want to I'm not sure who it is. Uh, so we're, we're always careful to do that. So, um, so I know that some of you have been hearing about our challenges. Um, how about everyone check their mics for me? Thank you. Director, I think that was Devin. Okay, thanks. Appreciate okay. it. So Devin. Yes. Diana. Yes. Nancy. Yes. Karen. 
Yes. Jamila? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Adam? Can you unmute Adam? Yes. Thank you. That's unanimous with 10 yeses. Okay, thanks Beth. All right, last agenda item, proposed ordinance relative to school zones. I'll read the ordinance. In the year 2023, upon the recommendation of the Transportation Parking Commission, an ordinance relative to school zones. An ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows. Section one, section 312-18 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-18, school zones. The following school zones are hereby established per MGL chapter 90, section 17. School, Northampton High School, Description of the school zone on Elm Street, extending from North Elm Street Route 9 to Hospital Road, on Elm Street Route 9, extending from Woodlawn Avenue to Vernon Street, on North Elm Street Route 9, extending from Woodlawn Avenue to a point 430 feet north of Elm Street, on Milton Street, extending from Elm Street to a point 585 feet south of Ormond Drive, School, Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School on Locust Street, extending from a point 145 feet west of North Elm Street to a point 720 feet west of Hatfield Street. So at previous meetings, we have stated that the high schools were ineligible for school zones. Massachusetts amendments on the Manual on Uniform Traffic Controls was recently updated to allow for school zones to include areas around high schools. Um, may I have a motion for a positive recommendation for this, please? So moved. And may I have a second? Second. So it, this, thank you. So this ordinance um, it proposes school zones for both the high school and Smith Vogue. Um, for the high school, because we're bordering multiple streets, um, we have to look at the whole network of, of area around the high school. And that's what we did in, the, in, in writing this language and in its establishment. Um, the extents of the school zones are determined based on guidance from the MUTCD, from the Mass Amendments to the MUTCD. Um, so what we have to do is uh, sort of measure, you know, what the frontage of, of the schools are and then sort of work off of what the regulations state uh, we can establish in a school zone. Um, I, I will also add um, that with the mayor's assistance, we have applied for uh, two grants through MassDOT to get for the city uh, flashing solar powered speed feedback signs um, with, with big signage that announces uh, on either end that you are entering a school zone. So if successful, um, we'd be looking at uh, those solar flashing lights, which by the way, are valued at like $10,000 a piece um, on either end of the school zone for both Smith Vogue and uh, the Northampton High School on that Route 9 corridor. Um, so, I, you know, I will also add that this has the added benefit um, per MGL of reducing the speed limit in an area that is declared a school zone, um, that speed limit now drops uh, and it drops to 20 miles an hour. Um, and, and so this, uh, you know, when folks say, well, you know, can you alter the speed limit? Here is how we can alter the speed limit. So we're very grateful to MassDOT um, for, for this um, legislation, which was recently passed for the grant opportunity, which, which I think is going to be a, a hopefully a, a benefit to us and, and hopefully we will be awarded it. Um, and, and I think that this will make a, a big impact. Mayor, I see you unmuted. Do you have a, a comment? Yeah, I also just want to um, tell, you know, make sure that people know by giving a shout out to Senator Comerford, who is really helpful. So this grant is was available per municipality, one school per municipality could apply. 
And I called up Senator Comerford and I said, well, we are the only municipality that has two districts. And I think that each district should have one school that can apply. Um, and she agreed and she went to bat for us. And um, so I just wanna give a big shout out to Senator Comerford who, um, who helped make that happen. So hopefully we will um, be awarded uh, these for both of our districts. Thank you, Mayor. And and if we are, um, it will. I do have to go through some procurement things to actually have them installed. As, as we will have to engage the services of, of a contractor, um, and we do have procurement rules that we have to follow. Um, but uh, ultimately, just to get the signs, which again are are quite valuable. I mean, the tens of thousands of dollars worth of signs. Um, we'd be very grateful to to be the recipients of those grants. So, um, any conversation or question that the actual um, pictorial representation of everything I said is is on the screen. Um, so any conversation or comments from members of the commission? Councilor Foster, go ahead. Just really brief to say that this is, um, it's just such a great change that school zones can be around high schools now. And when I look at just how far out around the high school, all of those roads that could be impacted um, with a lower speed limit during school hours, I, I'm just really supportive of this. And it's it's really nice to see that that we're able to, to bring this forward. Thank you, Councilor. And now, Councilor Nash, I see your hand up. Welcome. It's always a pleasure to be at the TPC. Hello, Director. Um, so I had a question in terms of the design. If the design, um, and this is a shout out to uh, Councilor Jarrett, if the design could take into account that there would be a 20 mile an hour speed limit going on here, that instead of, uh, and I know that it, 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 that is during school hours or whenever, but that if that, that aspect could be incorporated in the design of the travel lanes or any of the safety features here. Um, I, this is really welcome. The 35 miles an hour is, has always just not been uh, right. And, um, and that this opportunity to you know, adjust that along with the design is a really great opportunity. So thanks. Thank you, Councilor. Any other members of the public or members of the commission have any comments on this? And, and just to Councillor Nash's point, um, it, the imposition of the school zones uh, around the high school has, has been a topic of conversation with Preston O'Neill. They are aware um, that we are taking this action. And obviously, this would be a big part of, of any design moving forward. All right, so I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, we have a motion on the floor for a positive recommendation on this. We do. Thank you, Beth. So hearing no further comments and seeing no further comments from uh, folks watching, uh, Beth, I will ask you to call the roll, please. Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Devin? Yes. Diana? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Adam? Yes. Unanimous with 10 yeses. Thank you, Beth. Okay, does anybody have any new business for us? Hearing none, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? Move to adjourn. Move to second. Okay, Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Jody? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Devin? Yes. Diana? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Carolyn? Yes. Adam? Yes. That's unanimous 10. We're adjourning at 6.07. Thanks so much, everyone. Appreciate it.
everyone's time Good tonight. Night. Take care. Thank you.